Candlestar Press presents Song of the Mountain, The Mountain Trilogy, Book One, by Michelle Eisenhoff, narrated by Shay Taylor. Chapter One Song knew he was foolish to linger, but his feet refused to acknowledge the fear tapping on his shoulder. All around him the forest opened like a wide clay bowl, with a score of bamboo huts lying like pebbles in its bottom. Song had completed his task, but he paused, searching the village, seeking that one face that drew him despite the danger. He hiked his tunic above his knees and crept behind a wooden handcart. There he could overlook the dirt path that wandered in one side of the village and out the other, connecting it to other settlements far away. In both directions the path rambled along the curves of the mighty Chinyazi River, the lifeblood of the village. Song could see the river through a border of vegetation. The hot, rainy season was past, and the high waters had flowed away to the sea, leaving the steep banks dry and lush and fragrant. Above him, Mount Kamiratan rose like a great green father, and across the river the smaller heads of the Kindoli range peered at him over one another's shoulders. Song focused again on his purpose. His glance skipped over an old woman sitting in the dirt before her hut, weaving a basket out of willow strips. Neither did it linger on two small children who led a long-haired goat by a string around its neck, nor on the man who mended a hemp fishing net. Yet he could not find the face he sought. Ignoring the danger, he raised his head above the handcart, straining to scan the terraced fields beyond the village. There he is! Get him! Song abandoned his quest, and darted for the edge of the forest. Behind him the village boys spread out like a pack of wolves, closing in on a wounded deer. Song raced between the cultivated plots that marked the edge of the settlement. He ran, like a brook tumbling down the side of Mount Kamiratan, like the wind racing through the grass in Mamuri Valley, but he could hear bare feet pounding close behind him. If only he could reach the forest! The trees knew him well and would offer him a thousand shelters. But as he broke through the protective fringe of leaves, a body slammed into him and encircling arms dragged him to the ground. Before he could throw up his hands, all five boys were striking him, spitting, tearing at his hair and clothing. Song rolled himself into a ball, covered his head with thin arms, and absorbed the blows until they grew weary and lessened. Then a more painful assault began. Stand up and fight, boy! Don't lay there like a dead dog! The strongest of the boys stood over him, his fists resting on narrow hips. He couldn't fight if he tried, Kito. Look at him. He's as skinny as a fishing spear. My little sister could knock him down. All he's good for is reciting those ridiculous stories his grandfather makes up, mocked another. Kito snorted. The old one's thoughts have more twists than a mulberry branch, and this one is studying to become just as crazy as the old man. He scuffed a spray of dirt and leaf mold across Song and leaned down to sneer in his face. Not so fine now, are you, great one? Why don't you crawl back to the dung heap where you belong? The boys doubled over with laughter. Then with one final kick, Kito led them away, but their continued mockery drifted back to Song, scraping over him like bits of broken pottery. Misfit? Worthless? Not one of us. Song lay under the canopy of leaves a long time, letting the forest floor soak up the tears that dripped off his cheek. The same thing happened every time he had to visit the village. He could not hope to win against so many, because what they said was true. He was small and weak. That's what made his name such a cruel irony. Song Wei, the Great One, routinely beaten by peasant boys. Sometimes, Song hated his parents for choosing such a thoughtless name, or he would hate them if they were still a part of his life. But they were dead. For most of his thirteen years he had lived on the mountain with his grandfather. For a moment his anger rose up against the old man. Why couldn't grandfather fish or work a trade like everyone else in the village? Why did he live apart like an old hermit, dispensing proverbs and remedies and those silly fairy tales to anyone who would listen? Maybe if Grandfather tried a little harder to fit in, the village boys would leave Song alone. Then shame rose in his chest, like morning mist above the Chinyazi. 
turning his insides cold. If grandfather was just like anyone else, he would no longer be grandfather. He would only be what others made him, and grandfather was much too strong for that. Song rose painfully from the ground, wishing he had inherited a greater portion of the old man's inner strength, or at least enough physical strength to beat off his assailants. When he was out of sight of the last hut, he picked his way down to the well-worn path and turned homeward. A stone's throw beyond the village, the path crossed Lord Dolisu's road. The smooth path began at the river, at the Lord's private port, where ships disgorged his wealth and scores of servants carried it to his estate that sprawled like a lazy cat on the side of the mountain. The man owned Mount Kamiratan, and all the land from the valley to the river, including the village and the small plot Song and his grandfather cultivated. Today, no one labored at the harbor. Song's ribs ached with the fire of his beating, so he stole carefully to the river's edge to quench the burn. The river flowed yellow, thick with silt and the tears of the mountains. Bending down, Song splashed his stinging face, mingling his blood with the river. The water was cool and welcome, and he waded into it, lowering his body into its healing wash. Why, he wondered, did Mutan, the highest one, allow such inequality and injustice among men? Why could one man live in a palace, while others eked out a living from the dust of the ground, offering up their little to make the great ones greater? And beneath them all, a beetle in a dung heap, dwelt Song. Heaving a sigh, Song stood up with his clothes streaming, and listened to the music of the water returning to the river. In nature he could find beauty and justice, Whenever Grandfather didn't need his help, he roamed the mountain and the valley and the river. They had become his companions, his source of strength, and they never played favorites. Above the tune of the water, Song heard footsteps approaching on the village path. He ducked low and scooted among the leaves growing along the bank, unwilling to take any more risks. Parting the bushes with his hands, he watched a girl come to the water's edge and kneel down. She wore a long, dingy shift covered with a threadbare shawl, but her face was as fair as the lilies growing in Kamiratan's pool. The girl set something on the river and gave it a shove with a stick she found at her feet. It floated out into the current, and when it sailed past him, Song saw a little ship made out of many pieces of folded paper. As he looked on, the girl pushed a second vessel out to join the first and stood on the bank, watching until both floated around the bend in the river. When she turned to leave, Song shifted to keep her in sight, and the branch he clung to gave way. He took a small step, barely disturbing the water, but the girl heard it and whirled. Scanning the bank, her eyes followed the spreading ripples and caught the form of Song, crouching beneath the leaves. Who is there? Come out where I can see you. Reluctantly, Song dragged himself before the beautiful girl. She drew her shawl protectively about herself. Her lips parted and her eyes widened expectantly. But when she took in his size, his muddy, ripped clothing and the cuts on his lips and eye, her expression turned to bored disgust. Why are you spying on me? Song gulped. I only came to wash off, miss. Why do you not bathe in the village like everyone else? I... I his face burned. Well? His voice was barely a whisper. The boys will not let me, miss. She arched one beautifully shaped eyebrow. You are an outcast. Her lip curled in disdain. Go, be on your way, and do not show your face before me again. Song crept out of the water like a sodden rat, his face burning with shame. Great one indeed. As he picked his way past the girl, every footfall, every snapped reed, every beat of his heart reminded him that he would never amount to anything.